In this video, we'll continue the discussion on using transformations in order to determine congruence. However, whereas we used the coordinate plane in the first video, in this next video now, we're going to be taking our discussion just into regular plane space. Now, two big key ideas that held true in the first video are also going to follow us and still be applicable. The first key idea is that any two figures are congruent if and only if we can map one onto the other by using a sequence of rigid motions. That's an old idea, that's something that you've seen before, and that's something that we're going to continue to use and apply as we move forward through this unit. The second key idea is also something that you've seen before. Our translations, our reflections, our rotations are all rigid motions. In any sequence of these that maps one figure onto the other, is going to justify or prove congruency. All right, so let's see how we might take a look at an example of one of these that's not in the coordinate plane. In example one, they're asking us to use either a single transformation or a sequence of transformations in order to explain how, when a transversal co crosses parallel lines, the alternate exterior angles that are formed are always congruent to each other. So I'm going to go ahead and get my highlighter out, and first of all, refresh my memory about exactly where the alternate exterior angles would be in this picture. So angle 1 and angle 8 would be a pair of alternate exterior angles, as would be angle 2 and angle 7. So in other words, I want to use a sequence of rigid motions that will map angle 1 to angle 8 and that will map angle 2 to angle 7. Well, I'm going to start out, first of all, by addressing the yellow angles, angles 1 and angle 8. If I took a, take a look at angle 1 and I translate him down on top of angle 5 and then rotate him around 180 degrees, that'll map angle 1 onto angle 8. So that's going to be the general gist or the general transformation that I want to use in order to map angle 1 onto angle 8. In order to do the translation, however, I need to have a vector. Remember, a translation has to name both direction and distance. I'm going to call one of those red dots A, the other red point B, just so that I have something, some point of reference to talk about. So I'm going to translate angle 1 along vector AB, and then once he's superimposed on angle 5, I'm going to rotate him 180 degrees upon, around point B, which will map him onto angle 8. So now all I've got to do is go ahead and get this down in writing. So translate angle 1 using the vector named by points A and B. And rotate 180 degrees about point B. This sequence will map angle 1 onto angle 8. All right, now I need to talk about the green angles. This time, I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to rotate angle 2 180 degrees about point A. That'll map angle 2 onto angle 3. And then once I've rotated angle 2 180 degrees about point A, then I'm going to translate using that same vector AB. And that'll take angle 3 onto angle 7. In essence, what I've done is I've used two different transformations to map angle 2 onto angle 7, showing that they are indeed congruent to one another. I'm going to start by rotating about point A, 180 degrees. And again, I'm going to translate using vector AB, or the vector that moves points from A to B. And again, this sequence will map angle 2 onto angle 7.
Since in both cases I've identified a sequence of rigid motions that will map one alternate exterior angle onto the other, I can conclude that the alternate exterior angles are indeed congruent. So that same idea from the verse video still holds true. Anytime we can map one figure onto the other using a sequence of rigid motions, we can go ahead and conclude that the figures are congruent to each other. Now, the transformations that I picked, the translation followed by the rotation and then the rotation followed by the translation, are just one example of an acceptable sequence of transformations. So lots of times there will be many out there that will work. And you'll only need to find one. So again, you might have picked a different sequence of transformations than I did, but as long as you find a sequence that'll map one figure onto the other, you're all set to go ahead and say that those figures are congruent to each other. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at number two down at the bottom. It says in this diagram, we're given these triangles with these congruent figures or the congruent sides. I'm gonna go ahead and label all the given information to me. So side AB congruent to side XY, side CA is congruent to side CY, and lastly, segment XAC is perpendicular to segment BCY. So I'm gonna go ahead and label my figures. And again, they're asking us to describe a precise sequence of rigid motions that will show that the two triangles are congruent to one another. Well, I'm gonna give you a minute to pause the video and see if you can identify a sequence of rigid motions that will map one triangle onto the other. All right, when I looked at this, I said, I'm going to use my angle C as a center of rotation, and I'm gonna rotate triangle ABC 90 degrees clockwise. Rotating him 90 degrees clockwise will move point B on to point X, and will move or rotate point A on to point Y. Point C, being the center of, a ro of the rotation itself, will not move at all. So a rotation of 90 degrees in the clockwise direction, using point C as the center, will map triangle ABC onto triangle YXC, making them congruent to each other. So that's the sequence of rigid motions that I'm going for. You might have said I can take triangle XYC and I can rotate him 90 degrees counterclockwise about point C, and that will map one figure onto the other as well. It doesn't matter which one you use as long as you find that sequence of rigid motions that maps one figure onto the other. Since I wrote my rigid motions in sentence form up in number one, I think for this example, I will write them in function form. So I'm going to use a capital R to represent rotation. C is the center of my rotation. I want to rotate 90 degrees clockwise, meaning negative 90 degrees. The triangle that I want to rotate is triangle ABC. And the image that it maps to after that particular rotation is triangle YXC. Again, I could have written this out in sentence form. And if I had, my transformation would have been every bit is legitimate. So since there exists a rigid motion that will map one triangle to the other,
we can go ahead and conclude that triangle BAC must be congruent to triangle XYZ. Okay, as always, I do want you to take a few minutes and reflect upon what you just saw and see if you can separate what's really truly important about the video from what maybe isn't quite so important. What are the essential takeaways that I wanted you to get out of spending 10 minutes or so with this video? And then see if you can apply what you've learned by watching this video to answer questions one and two.